I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world, uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, I love it. Welcome to City Bakes. This time on City Bakes, I'm exploring the blend of old and new in Dublin. It's a celebration of the taste of the flour. The humble Irish potato tastes better than ever. Ireland on the plate, the whole thing is absolutely beautiful. I meet bakers celebrating old-fashioned breads. It's just like a big kid playing with Play-Doh again. Exactly. And with chefs pushing boundaries. That is a piece of art on its own. My friend, author and TV presenter Clodagh McKenna and I make two very different soda breads. They look great, don't they? And I put my spin on a pecan pie with a glug of Irish stout. You can taste the stout, can't you? That's a really nice flavour there, yeah. Welcome to City Bakes in Dublin. Few countries in the world seem as universally loved as Ireland. When the Vikings landed here over a thousand years ago, they knew they were onto a good thing and stayed to found its capital city, Dublin. This is the River Liffey that runs through the heart of Dublin. It's the same really in any city around Europe. You have a river that runs through the middle and all the businesses spring from it and the city gets bigger and bigger and bigger and Dublin is no different. The pub culture is huge here. But there's more to the city than the crack. It has a thousand-year-old history with beautiful Georgian architecture and a vibrant art scene. Here's one gentleman that comes from Dublin that I think everybody will know. The famous poet and playwright Oscar Wilde. In fact, he was raised in that house over there on the corner, number one. But I love some of his sayings. A couple of them I disagree with, namely this one. There is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about. That is not being talked about. I prefer not to be talked about. <laughs> so, instead, let's talk about Dublin. It's just a stone's throw across the Irish Sea from my hometown of Liverpool. After the potato famine in the 19th century, many Irish families fled to Liverpool, and so the Irish culture is very familiar. I don't come to Ireland enough, you know. I need to come more. I know it's in my family somewhere. I think it's on my nan's side, my dad's mum's side. Like many European cities, it's evolving fast. With over half of the people here under 36, there's a great energy here. It's a happy place, though, Dublin. I think most of the Irish have a big smile on their faces. Why not? The food here is excellent. Dublin once had an incredible 1,400 bakeries across the city. So this is a baking culture I'm going to love. Dubliners were known as being proper bread eaters. So it's no surprise I've not had far to go to find a decent bakery, and it's the oldest one in town. They've been baking bread since 1870, and it's the perfect place for me to indulge in a secret habit of mine, ordering loads of local bakes. Could I have a brown soda bread, farmhouse, a turnover? See, that for me screams Irish bacon. I've invited my Dublin friend, chef and author, Clodagh McKenna, to stop by. Hello, Clodagh. Hello. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome to Dublin. Thank you. I love it. But before we get into the breads, Clodagh wants me to try an unusual cake. There's one thing I'm, I'm nearly sure they do here as well. Okay. It's the Gur cake. Let me get it for you. Can't miss that. Gur yeah, cake. Okay. Never heard of it. So this is the Gur cake. This is basically all leftover bits of cake and bread that's made into breadcrumbs. They mix it all together in a mix, and then they sweeten it up, and then there's a lovely pastry made. A delicacy made from mashed-up leftovers. Okay. Oh, yummy. 
It is nice. Yeah. It's spicy, it's got cinnamon, it's got mixed spice. One thing I love though is the pastry is, is really crumbly, flaky, buttery. This was the cheap cake that you get at the end of the day, you know? Just so it's a win win. Yeah, you know? yeah. Now to the bread. I want to find out more about this classic Dublin batch turnover. Doesn't this look beautiful, even just, just looking at it? The turnover um, came from the batch bread. So the batch bread would be the original bake. A batch bread means it's baked as many individuals which join together during proving and then they bind together during the bake and then you break them off and sell them individually. Mm. And then what was left over, all the little bits would be rolled up and used to add this kind of boot-like shape onto it, using up everything that was left over in the bakery. I suppose it's like a bloomer, but that's a disservice. It's got more of a fluffy texture to that. It's softer to eat. Now, this has a great history in Ireland. It was known as the priest bread first, not particularly the turnover, but the batch bread it was the priest bread because you'd buy it when the priest was coming to visit on a Sunday or something. So you buy the best one. Yeah, you always exactly. buy the best one. They go, oh, exactly. the father's coming today. The priest is coming. When everyone thinks of Ireland, they think of one bread. Yeah. And that is the soda bread. Well, for me, it's got such a, so much strings to me, emotion. Like, you know, growing up, you made it every single week. Soda bread is risen with baking soda rather than yeast, so it's as quick to rise as a cake or a scone. And the texture is lovely, it's crumbly. This is the everyday bread. This is Ireland. A lot of breads nowadays are overtaken with yeast, fermentation. You don't get that in soda bread. So what you've got is a celebration, the taste of the flour. That's what makes Irish soda bread so good. Paul, that's such a beautiful way of putting it. <laughs> Really? I've done it before, you know. Have you? You do know it's my job. <laughs> I'm getting a real sense of a waste not, want not attitude here. Ireland used to be a poor country, and that history is reflected in their food. My next stop is with a man who's made it his mission to elevate the status of one of the most simple and cheap ingredients out there, an Irish staple, the humble spud. He's a potato aficionado, and well, he's up there. Porrick. Hello. Hi, mate. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm actually harvesting some heritage potatoes. OK. He actually grows spuds in flower boxes up there. Do you want some? Yeah. I'll throw them down to you. Porrick O'Callagher is so passionate about the potato, he set up his own restaurant in the Temple Bar area, specialising in these heritage Irish spuds. Yep. Very good. We've got a couple of spuds here. Let's go inside then. Right, come on Look in. at him, covered in Irish air. He has uncovered and revived old potato varieties that were common in Ireland hundreds of years ago. Do you know everything there is to know about spuds, don't you? I'm learning. I'm really? Learning. Yeah, everyone's a student. I'm always learning. OK, so what are we going to make with these spuds? Well, I'm going to use the lumpers today and we're going to make some box tea. Traditionally, box tea is a cooked blend of potato and wheat flour. There are three types of box tea. There's boiled box tea, there is baked box tea, and there's pan box tea, and there's a rhyme. Box tea on the griddle, box tea in the pan. If you can't make box tea, you'll never get a man. <laughs> Porrick is going to show me how to make two of his most popular dishes, box tea dumplings and box tea pancake. And what makes boxing different to other potato breads is we use grated raw potato in it. You notice I don't, don't bother peeling this, because if I was to peel this, I'd lose about 40% and I'd be out of business. Porrick's potato of choice is the lumper. This potato was predominantly grown in Ireland pre-famine. 80% of the crop of the country was a lumper potato. There were 3 million people that lived solely on potatoes. The population was about 8.5 million, and of that 3 million, they ate potatoes every day. So they had potatoes for breakfast, a dinner, and box tea for their tea they would have eaten five kilos, about 14 pounds of potato a day. Wow. Every day, and very little else. Maybe some buttermilk. I've heard of the potato farm, and I understood what happened. And it came down to this spud. A disease came in and just wiped it out. Light wiped out all the potato in the country. You know, when you had a monocrop culture of people surviving on one thing, it just doesn't work, you know? Yeah. And it was wrong, very wrong. This is actually very therapeutic, doing this squeeze and extracting this moisture. I always think of my bank manager. <laughs> the grated potato is combined with leftover mash and flour. I'm going to put you to work. OK. We need to knead it into a dough. The simple dough can be used for boxty bread and dumplings. 
Wow, you're just using the residue of that spud. Exactly, yeah. Just squeezing the potato will provide just enough moisture. I mean, actually, it's holding together quite nicely. Yeah. Traditionally, that would have made two box tea dumplings, yeah? Yeah, two. Two. Two box tea dumplings. That's a big lump, isn't it? That's exactly what it was. See how you're going with that here, yeah? We can add just... That's good. We need some baby boxy dumplings out of this. Whilst little boxy dumplings simmer, it's on to boxy pancakes. Porik adds milk and flour to raw and mashed potato to make a batter. Competition time. Right, OK. <laughs> the main trick with boxy pancakes is you don't have a hot pan. And just leave it alone. Just let it... If you're cooking it too fast, what's going to happen is the bottom of it will, will burn. So once it's dry, we'll be able to flip. Does it break up quite easily? <laughs> Mine won't. <laughs> oh, there's a challenge here now, isn't there? And I give you the good pan. Don't start making excuses already. <laughs> you ready to go? Yeah. One, two, three. Oh, nice. Actually, nicer. Is that nicer? Mine's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> the boxy might be part of the food history of Dublin, but by updating the cooking methods and adding in the freshest Irish ingredients, today, it's something else. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, Billy. I want to try the heart of the dish. These dumplings are delicious. It takes the potato to a whole new level, blending it with this modern take on food. The whole thing is absolutely beautiful. Wow. Enjoy. So now we've got the boxy pancake. The knife just drops through that pancake. Look at that. So you have the pancake wrapped around the steak with this little bit of hint of mustard in there, get a little bit of heat in there as well. So the whole thing together is unbelievable. I have nothing but admiration for Porridge. He's adapted this humble vegetable, the potato, and turned it into pure, unadulterated magic. I will never look at a spud again in the same way. So far, I'm loving Dublin's food scene. And the nightlife here in Temple Bar doesn't disappoint either. With over 750 pubs across the city, I'm spoilt for choice. Luckily, I've got my pal Porrick with me to steer me in the right direction. And this is the Palace Bar. This traditional pub has been serving Dubliners since 1823. How are you? You well? Yeah? See ya. Good. Yeah. Hey, mind, Paul. Paul. How are you? This pub has been in landlord Willie's family for three generations. He's teamed up with a local distillery to bring back their house whiskey. And he's extremely proud of it. We're the first bar since the early 70s to revive the tradition of being our own whiskey bonder again. Like most houses in the 40s, 50s, 60s, your whiskey would have come in in a, in a cask, delivered, yeah. and you would have had a porter downstairs, so you would have bottled your own whiskey. Yeah. But in the early 70s, it died out due to health and safety and quality. So about four years ago, we came up with, to, it'd be great to revive that tradition again. And sticking with tradition, I've got to have a pint of the black stuff along with my Irish whiskey. It's not Well, actually, it's quite smooth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. As the Irish say, it's a good crack in here. The thing is about coming to a pub like this is it's part of our DNA. And I don't think it's a pure Irish thing. It's, it's very much a UK and Irish thing. It's a great place to be. And I think I'll be propping up the bar for a few more hours yet. Slancha, Paul, and welcome Slancha. to Dublin. Thank you, buddy. Thank yeah. you. I've been exploring the capital city of Ireland, Dublin, and this morning, I have one thing on my mind. Having had a few stouts yesterday, what I need is a little bit of a pick-me-up, and the place to go to is just here. And I've heard there's a bread roll so good, it's been awarded protected status. How are you doing? Hello, how are you? Good. Hi, Dominic. Nice, nice to meet you. you. 
So this is the blower, is it? World famous blower. You see, I've seen rolls like this before. Yeah. They're either called batch, bomb cake, or baps all over the UK. Over here, they're called blur. <laughs> OK. It's similarity. There is a There's similar... a B. <laughs> exactly. But apparently, this has got um, DOP on them now. Yeah. They've got... Yeah, so it joins, a... like, Parmaham, Camembert, Cornish all these pasties. things. Yeah, totally. It's, like, it's a protected foodstuff now, so which is absolutely wonderful for the bakers down in Waterford. Dominic's blurs can only be made in the county of Waterford, and her rolls travel a full 100 miles north to Dublin. Brian Hickey is a third-generation baker and has been producing them since the 50s. He makes an incredible 8,000 blahs by hand every night. People love them here. Across Waterford County, 20,000 are sold every day. In fact, they are so loved that locals campaigned for the recognition for the blah, and it now holds the same special protected designation of origin status as champagne. Is there any chance of a bacon one, please? A bacon one, absolutely. We can get that for you, no problem. This is one bread I have to try. Well, there's my bacon butty. I need this. The roll is very typical of what you think it is. It's light, it's fluffy. The fact that the Irish have got behind the product, make it in the numbers that they do, and then protect it, is to be patted on the back. You love it. Ireland's appetite for great bread doesn't end here. I'm travelling six miles north of Dublin to a bakery that I've heard makes one of the best fruit loaves in the city. Bread enthusiast Simon May set up his artisan bakery only two years ago, but he and his fellow bakers Jonathan and Varsha already have an award shelf that most bakers would envy. Hello, Simon. Yes, Paul. Nice to Hello. Good to meet you. Your breads look amazing. Thank you very much. If you look at this stuff here, you have the sourdough, you have the spelt, you have the multigrain, you have a variety of different breads. Then you have this line here, this strong Irish influence, the turnover, the batch bread. That is a classic. But what I'm here for is to try their version of the traditional Irish fruit loaf, known as barn brac. There we go. Wow, okay. Which is already being talked about as the best in Dublin. Think of a tea cake with lots of fruit in it and a much bigger structure. That's what you've got. That's the only thing I can relate it to. It tastes delicious, but the beauty of it is every single bite you get a mouthful of fruit. But in Dublin, this is way more than just a delicious tea cake. Am I right in saying this is a seasonal loaf? It is a seasonal loaf. It's a sort of Halloween-type loaf, and particularly at Halloween, it gets a charm put inside. Um, a charm put inside? A charm. In the kitchen out back, baker Jonathan has agreed to show me the secrets of their rather charming bake. Now, is this a recipe you designed, played with to get rice? We tweaked a few bits and pieces until we got it right. Um, took a bit of work last year, but we got it eventually where we wanted it, and I, I think it's, it's doing well. Jonathan begins by combining eggs, milk and water to the mix of flour, butter, yeast, salt and spice. Right, so we start off in slow and we give it about three minutes. Once it's a smooth dough, a huge quantity of dried fruit is added. So it's a combination of sultanas, currants, mixed peel. I've never seen so much fruit in a bread. It's a clever balance of fruit and dough that makes this extra special. As a baker, that volume of fruit in there makes the making of this tricky. The yeast tries to work, but there's so much fruit, it has to lift and carry, and that's what slows it up. But, again, that gives it the flavour. After a couple of hours of fermentation, the flavours and the yeast have developed. Now, the Irish love a tradition. The barn brack's not just packed with fruit, it also contains lucky charms, rings and coins. The history of this loaf um, dates back to sound, which is an old pagan festival. If you got a coin, it's good fortune. Between now and the next harvest or the next sound, you're going to become a rich person. Can you put a couple in mind for me? That'd be grand. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, if you get a ring, you're going to be married within a year. Don't put one of them in. No, no you don't need one some, of them. Just put a coin in. <laughs> right, we just stick it there. After proving, the barn brack is glazed. Then it's into the oven for 35 minutes. It's a great-looking loaf. It really is. 
Now, which loaf has my lucky charm in? I just read the loaf looking for it. <laughs> Isn't it difficult? There's oh. definitely one in here, is there? Just... Ah! Did you get it? I oh, did. you're the lucky one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. Ah. Look, a ring. I'll pass that on to my son. Although, because he's only 15, it's going to be a few years. There you have it. You're looking charm, barn brack. Simon and his team have taken the traditional Irish barn brat recipe and put in the time to elevate it, making it even more delicious than it was. Now, there's one bread you have to try when you come to Dublin, and that's soda bread. It's everywhere, it's made here, it's beautiful. And now I'm on my way to meet Cloda in the kitchen and get baking myself. Hello, hello! Hello, Cloda. Yay, you came! <laughs> You're on. Soda bread time! Cloda has decided that while in Dublin, it's essential I learn the secrets of the bread she grew up with. And we used to make this on Saturday mornings out of necessity for making the bread for the week. There was no kind of romantic motion of, you know, flour everywhere and all the kids having fun. We baked because we had to have, the, you know, the bread in for the week. But this was the bread that was always sitting, always placed in the middle of the table mm. before anything else was placed on the table and a big slab of good old salted Irish butter. I mean, what else would you want? So that, that is a taste of home for you then, isn't it? Totally. Now, I've made soda bread for years, but is Cloda's family recipe better? Only one way to find out. Are you going to go first? No, we're going to do it together. All right, fair enough. Here, gather what you want. I love that. You have that. So what are you going to do? I'm going to do a soda bread with roasted potatoes and rosemary. I'm doing um, my sweet Cloda bread. With orange and sultanas. Did you just say Cloda bread? <laughs> I know. I didn't name it that. A very famous uh, music producer called William Orbit made up a song because I t taught him how to make it and he made up a song about the Cloda bread and it's just stuck. Soda bread is so easy. This is my foolproof recipe. First, take white flour and equal parts of wholemeal flour. I'm going to add a teaspoon of soda and a teaspoon of salt. Give that a mix together. And that basically is the core ingredients for the soda bread itself. The soda is the alkali. So the chemical reaction happens when I add the acid, which is from the buttermilk, in with the alkali. That creates the soda, or the fizz, which creates the growth in the loaf. So it's not growth in the loaf. I know. I feel like you're doing a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to add this buttermilk, roughly about 400 ml. Get my hand in there and just bring it all together. You use buttermilk. I use a mixture of milk and yogurt together. Mm. And the reason why I started that is just because I wasn't able to get buttermilk in uh, the supermarkets. Well, you're going to get the same effects. Your soda is going to react with the lactic acid in the, in the milk. Yeah, exactly. And that will create the rise from that. So there I have my dough. We've literally just stirred it together with your fingers, with your hands, with a spoon. It doesn't really matter. Now, here we have some roast potatoes, which are left over from a Sunday roast. With my rosemary still attached to it, I'm going to add these to my mixture. And again, incorporate those potatoes into your base dough just by folding. Don't need, don't be oh, tempted. Are you not mashing your potatoes? No, no, no. It'll break up with, with your knuckles anyway, to be honest. So once you've got that and it's all incorporated, you end up with a ball of dough that looks like this. Now, at that stage, I'll just shape it into a ball, flatten it down slightly, and I'm good to go. That looks beautiful. OK, so what I've put into mine, because this is sweet, so I've got sh a little bit of sugar in here. Mm -hmm. I've sultanas in here. I've fresh orange juice. I've orange zest. Place the loaf on a line tray and then cut straight down to the base. Bring this together. I've got a little bit of sea salt, which I'm just going to sprinkle on the top as well. It's amazing how messy that looks. Are you I'm kidding just, me? I'm not having a go. I'm you're just like saying. here in Ireland and you're like baking with me and you're telling me my bread is messy. I'm just saying what? that it looks a bit messy. It's not. It's gorgeous. It's rustic. Yeah, that's Get another way of putting it. it. Informal. I like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You've actually got. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got to milk you. Cloda is taking a very traditional approach. This is the blessing of the bread. 
And then we do a thing called pinching the fairies. This is traditional when you make the soda bread. You pinch here, you pinch here, you pinch and pinch, and you let the fairies out. And then I put a little bit of orange zest on top as well. You know this is going to be delicious, right? Oh, yeah. OK, let's put them into the oven. At least they go into the same temperatures. We don't have to argue about that. Literally seconds after mixing, these loaves are baking. 30 minutes at a high temperature, and they're done. They look great, don't they? You have to start with the savoury first. So yeah. here's the potato and the rosemary. Yeah. There's uh, some butter here. Yeah. Got some Irish butter. Mmm. Mm. That works for me. That's gorgeous. Actually, the salty um, butter, mm. it's very creamy, it's silky, with the roughness from that, and then the potato and the rosemary. That's... Nice. I like that. That's beautiful. And for Cloda's version, it's Cloda bread time. Look at that. Hello. Hello, bread orange. heaven. Yeah. Yummy, right? That, is, that does it's smell good. It's a fluffy the smell of orange in there. It smells fruity. That's delicious, though. It's good, isn't it? Mm. I had to wait to get all the flavours come through. I got the orange, I got the sultanas. Together is absolutely delicious. I think it's really well done. We've done Irish bread proud right here. I'm feeling this. What's cheers again in there? Schleunter. 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 That's delicious. I am thoroughly enjoying being back in Dublin. Their bakes have a comforting familiarity. The beauty of it is, every single bite, you get a mouthful of fruit. And I get a real sense of family and community here. That's delicious, sir. It's good, isn't it? But it's not just the Irish food that I like. I'm quite partial to a pint of the black stuff. When you think of Ireland, you think of stout. Stout is that dark ale that has become synonymous now with Irish pubs. And there's one brand that has done exceptionally well. Guinness. Established in 1759, this drink has become huge all over the world. They sell a whopping 50 million barrels a year. So it's no surprise that one of the top tourist destinations in the city is their brewery, where you can try all the weird and wonderful flavors. Are you Podrick? I am. Nice, nice to meet you. Podrick. Here, they experiment with different beers, including burnt sugar with sea salt and apple. It's quite a light flavour. It's not a heavy flavour, but it's there. It is. That works. Not all of these blends will make it to the shop floor, but it's certainly fun trying to guess the ingredients. Almost whiskey-like. You are bang on the money with whiskey. So this is one of our Guinness stouts aged in a bourbon cask. But what I'm really here for is the food. I'm going behind the scenes into the restaurants where they're also playing around with flavours. Now, I want to introduce you to a guy I know called Jock. He's the chef of this establishment. So he develops recipes using the black drink. I've used stout in my cooking for years, so I'm intrigued to see how Jock is pushing it forward. Hi, Jock, you all right? Yeah, come on, man, Pop. Nice Pop. to see you. Welcome to the Guinness right. House. So obviously, I think of Guinness as the drink, but you've taken Guinness to another level, haven't you? We have. I mean, Guinness has been cooked with for over 250 years. Has it? It has a day it's, since the force was brewed. What have we got here? We have the Guinness oysters, and there's a little twist to it. We put a Guinness hollandaise sauce, but we've done it with a little bit of bacon and cabbage as well, so keeping it a little bit more Irish. You know, it's probably one of our most popular dishes in the restaurant now. Can I try one of these? I'll try one myself. Wow. That's a meaty oyster, that one. That is delicious. The saltiness to the oyster as well just blends in well with the Guinness. Yeah, it's a, you've got a taste of the sea yeah. and a taste of the land as well. As well as oysters, it's no surprise that they're making cakes with stout too. But I've never heard of it being used in scones. It's great with soups, but also blue cheese. So we tend to serve this with sharp food against the sweetness of the, the Guinness. Look at the colour in there. You can see the Guinness colour. Scone is obviously traditionally quite white or yellow, depending on your flour. But you've managed to get quite a rich colour out of there. You know, you play on the ingredients. We have black treacle in there, so that gives you the caramel, the sweetness. You know, it, with draft Guinness, you tend to get uh, coffee flavours. You tend to get caramel, you get chocolate flavours. That's yeah. nice, though. I like that. All these individual pieces 
really celebrate the great Irish yeah. house. I mean, it is beautiful. And you've got a great job, haven't you? It's a terrific job. And I've got to say, I'm pretty pleased with my job right now, too. Dublin is one of those cities with incredible landscapes right on the doorstep. So I've decided to test out some of the great driving roads through the Wicklow Mountains. We often hear Ireland being described as the Emerald Isle. And it's lush, it's green. This is where it's got its name from. I've always loved wild open spaces, and this totally floats my boat. Stretched out before me, is the vast estate of the Guinness family in Lake Tay. You'll notice as well the sand at the top, which is unusual. That was brought in. Locals joke that it makes the lake look a little bit like the paint of the family's famous stout. The town of Delgeny is just up the road from here, and I'm off to meet a guy who has invited me to bake with him. Patrick Ryan trained as a lawyer, but always wondered if a baker's life was for him. He traveled the world learning about baking, then returned home and opened up his firehouse bakery and cafe. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. What a great looking place. Yeah, thanks very much. This has a real buzz about it. I mean, look at the people in here, it's round. So this is a daily thing. Patrick bakes the usual European bakes, but what I've really come here to see is his award-winning batch bread. It's the same white pillowy loaf I've seen before, with the batch turnover and water for blas. I'm hoping that if I get stuck into helping him, Patrick might share a few of his secrets. I love batch bread. I used yeah. to do it a lot in Liverpool as well, actually. So I'm curious to see how you guys do it. Traditionally, like the batch, it's very simple. We decided to kind of change it up a little bit, add a bit of richness to it. So we use uh, a buttermilk, okay. which actually just some in the fridge if you want to grab it. This is cultured buttermilk. It brings a lovely level of acidity and all the milk fats to the bread. We're using about 500 litres of it a week. So this one, we actually get it from Wicklow Farmhouse, which is just down the road. Um, so it's pasteurised, but it's not homogenised. Yeah. So all the rich is in it, all the fats in it, all the cream still there. Wow. So if you give it a good shake, you'll see it's, it's quite thick. Oh, it is, isn't it? It's like yoghurt. <laughs> We're just going to do a very simple batch. We've got, like, three kilos of flour. Strong flour? It is indeed, yeah. And then you're going to go with all that buttermilk. So we're looking at about just over two litres. OK. Patrick adds salt and fresh yeast. I think it's probably better off if you... Uh, if you I'll have a go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's just like a big kid playing with Play-Doh again. Exactly. That's what it is. But even now, already, you can see that dough changing. It is. When you look at that texture there, I think you need to get it much smoother than that. You go past this stage, which looks like the back of my mum's leg. <laughs> I've never seen your mum's legs, but... <laughs> so you're working that through, aren't you? Building up the gluten. So pretty much, that's us done. As you can see, the dough's much, much smoother. It's yeah. got the elasticity. So that's our dough. A little bit of oil on top just to stop it drying out. And we're going to set that aside to prove. Patrick has this morning's batch ready to shape. It's a bigger quantity, but as you can see, full of air. Basically, we're just looking to knock our dough back. We're going to scale this off. OK. So I'll scale you roll. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Hearing the sound of a scraper going off ah. is just fantastic. Patrick's work here really takes me back when I first started baking in Liverpool. The loaves proved together for another two hours. This and the baking process binds them together, making a batch. This is proper old school, you know. Do you know why I love these as well? Because they've got proper colour on the top. Oh, yeah. That's where the flavour is for me. They look amazing. And this is, like, the fun part. Breaking them up. Oh, yeah. Have you ever had a tato sandwich? No. Potatoes are the, these are the king of all crisps. So we're looking at a crisp sandwich. Oh yeah. Just after a few beers. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Winner. I love you, Patrick. <laughs> the flavour's there. The texture's fantastic. The crisps inside it. It's basic. It's simple. It's delicious. It's the best. I love it, mate. 
Brilliant. I've tried a lot of breads in my time. Yeah, you can try your sourdoughs and all the fancy stuff, and it's great, and it tastes great. But actually, when you get rid of all those layers and go back to the earthy, traditional loaf, such as the batch bread, that, for me, is the king of bread. I'd love to stick around and try some more bakes, but my mate Cloder has summoned me back to the city to witness something rather special. So this is proper Dublin where we are right now. This is North Dublin, Moore Street. You can't get any more inner Dublin than this. During the day, this is full of traders yeah. selling their vegetables and, and everything. And this is where the Sound Parade will happen in a few minutes. Tonight happens to be the 31st of October. To most of us, that's Halloween. But here in Ireland, it's the Samhain Festival. Halloween started in Ireland with the Samhain Festival. And the reason the festival was started what is, was to get rid of all of the spirits. And so people would dress up in costume. Yeah. And they would... Speaking of which... A little Irish devil? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and the Samhain Festival, that's how Halloween started. That looks incredible. They've really gone to town on some of these costumes and designs. I wasn't expecting this in Dublin. The Irish sure know how to party. I'm in Dublin, getting under the skin of this dynamic capital. I've been told that the city stadium is a must visit, as it's one of Europe's largest. But unless you're a fan of Gaelic sports, You've probably never heard of it. Not a bad view, is it? Welcome to the roof of Croke Park Stadium. This is in the heart of Dublin. It seats 83,000 people, the third largest stadium in Europe. But a lot of people come here for this. This is the Skywalk. Come on, come and look at this. As you get to the end down here, you have the perfect view of the ground itself. I, sometimes I get a little bit nervous with heights, so I, I might get quiet for a minute. <laughs> wow, look at that. What a view. I'm just going to go this way. With my feet firmly back on the ground, my next and final port of call is the Merrion Hotel, Morning. where I've heard they put a creative spin on their afternoon tea. What makes this place slightly different from most five-star hotels is actually what's on the walls. The owners of this hotel have the largest private collection of artwork in the whole of Ireland. This is not just a hotel, it's an art gallery. No, you're not watching an art show, you're watching City Bakes. So, I need to go and find the kitchen. Head pastry chef Paul Kelly has got something to show me. Paul. Hey there, buddy. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Right. Welcome to the pastry kitchen at the Thank Korean. you very much for allowing me in your kitchen. <laughs> Chef Paul was set an unusual challenge by the hotel owners to create an afternoon tea inspired by their art collection. I took a few weeks and I came back looking at the artwork in a different way. You know, you look at a picture, you see colours, you match them with flavours, you see angles, you match them with shapes. After a lot of research and trial and error, Paul has come up with these beauties. Each individual cake represents a painting in the hotel. Well, it's very important that when the guest sees the painting, it really makes sense then, because the colours have to be perfect. So this is white chocolate? This is white chocolate crunch. And then we simply just fill it. Look at that. I mean, that is absolutely beautiful. That is a piece of art on its own. Look at the colours on that. This is passion fruit and raspberry tart. A little chocolate, this, just to kind of support things. A raspberry filled with uh, lemon curd on top. 
I love to be pushed and to be given different challenges, whether it's uh, doing art afternoon tea or creating desserts or bread, whatever, it doesn't matter. Well, that looks like a Picasso, you know? See that there, that line between the biscuit and the icing? Do you realize how difficult that is? It's been put in and it's perfect on top of that as a piece of art. But Paul, normally the guest has a card. Make it very simple. There's a picture on the card, a description of the painting. But not for you. We're going on a treasure hunt. Hang on. You want me to find the pictures to marry up with these? Yep. Under pressure. Oh, hang on. This is this is this is <laughs> this an is easy. easy. One, this one. <laughs> yeah. Now, that is obviously this. Now, in many ways, this was quite easy as the shape of the table for me had to be a biscuit. Eating a good biscuit is all about flavors and textures and you're getting that all the way through this. It's almost short bread like, but it's very, very short. That is beautiful. Marries up with the artwork. Very, very clever. This is bizarre. <laughs> I'm walking around the hotel with the chef uh, with a load of afternoon tea looking for a picture. Oh, hang how on. you feel? How are you feeling? I'm seeing some colors here. Yeah, look, come on. See that there? And the lines there. I have to go with that one. For? For that. Yeah. And you're spot on, Paul, because the colours here is what I've seen here. So we did raspberry and passion fruit flavours here. You have got the colours there really well. Spot on. The contrasting base, which is crispy, and the top, which is beautiful and soft, and intense with passion fruit. Every one of those component parts is absolutely beautiful. It's about a celebration, not only of flavour, technique, skill of the chef, but also the eye, to be able to create what essentially is modern art into food to represent what's on the walls of this beautiful hotel. I enjoyed that, actually, mate. Ah, me too. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've sampled a wonderful range of food and bakes whilst I've been here in Dublin. And before I leave, Chef Paul is letting me borrow his kitchen. Hey, Cheers, Paul. Appreciate it. So, this is my recipe for a Dublin stout and pecan pie. Right, to start with, you need to make your base. So you need to make your pastry at the bottom. Here, I've got plain flour, to which I add icing sugar. Then add salted butter and break it down until it looks like fine breadcrumbs. We need to enrich it. So I'm going to add an egg, yolk, and a little splash of water. That will just bring the ingredients together. Get your fingers in there, break up the egg, Mix the whole thing together. That's the pastry. So give that a little bit of working. Just fold it a couple of times. I've got some pastry which I have chilled down. It's always good to chill this thing down. Just makes it rolling out so much easier. I've got my cakes in here. Loose bottom tin. Once you've got the right size, line your tin and push your dough right into the corners. Like any pie, this needs blind baking, trimming, and cooling. Then add sugar, butter, golden syrup, and treacle to your pan. Lots and lots of multi flavor in there. And then I've got chocolate. Choice of chocolate's up to you. Now this will go on at low heat, and this will slowly melt. As it's melting, add in that essence of Dublin, a good glug of Irish stout. It smells like the brewery again. Adding eggs and cream will help the mixture thicken. Just a little bit at a time. Don't put your heat on too high, because what will happen, this will end up being like scrambled egg. In go the chopped pecans, then pour straight into a tart case. And then you get your half pecans and go right round the outside with the pecans. Pop in the oven to bake for 35 minutes. Bring it out, and rather than putting it on a rack, put it on the floor where it's nice and cold, as long as your floor's not lino. Rather than dropping when it comes out of the oven and cools, it'll stay absolutely dead flat. That's a little secret. It might not be inspired by a painting. Thank you. But I think Dublin is in every bite. I hope you enjoy this, actually. But it should taste pretty good. Well, I love the look of it already. You know, it looks it's lovely gooey, and moist. Isn't it? Yeah, gooey yeah. is right. Oh, you can taste the stout, can't you? It's got a beautiful, rich flavour as well, and you can definitely taste the stout, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm glad you like it. Mate. That's a really nice flavour there, yeah. I love this city. What you have in Dublin 
is a blend of traditional, which is looking over the shoulder back at the history, but with a massive sway towards the future of Dublin, and in fact, the whole of Ireland. When you think of Porrig with the box tea, with the humble potato, what he's done to it, yes, he's creating the traditional, but it's got a modern twist on it. <laughs> Likewise, when you think of the barn brack, the fruit's been upped. When you think of the batch bread, it's not just water or milk going in there now, it's buttermilk, it's enriched. I will definitely come back to Dublin for the food, but also for the crack. <laughs> the people here are amazing.